<laughs> yes, I, I, I strongly advise to, to attack our 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 panel and our okay. speakers. Just for, for, for the well, I thought we were supposed to attack each other. Actually, but, uh, you, you were disappointed. I was very disappointed. Yes. <laughs> so we'll check in then. Yes. Okay. Uh, I agree. Uh, so the, the, why? So the, the first point is that I would like to make is as we have seen in the presentations. Basically, each talk, we're focusing on introspection in slightly different aspect, and was defining introspection in slightly different aspect. But each one of you, by looking at the, at the and each one of from, from the audience, by looking at the presentation, could say that all of them were about introspection. So there must be something which could be called a common denominator or a, or a set of features that is common for, for, for introspection even though that they differ so much. So my, my first question, which is both for panelists and also for the audience, like, what are those common features that are defining or they are describing something as being introspective? And I don't want to now to end with, the, with Oliver Brock, six uh, argument, the six, uh, six points where he was taking from philosophy and stuff like this, but what is a common denominator of introspection in robotics, even though that was so different for you? I would like to make a proposal because we, we have time to kind of tell people what we believe that is. Mm -hmm. I think it'd be much more interesting to hear what you guys believe that is, given everything that you've heard. Okay, that's that's a great point. Mm -hmm. Does anybody want to start by uh, defining? Not even defining, but just putting some definition. If you can come up with definition, that would be great. But it's not. So the thing I took from all the, the talks is. Uh, it's knowing what you don't know. That's that's the I think that's the summarizing for me. Uh, but it's very difficult. Yeah, I still don't understand how it how it can be done in a, in all cases. Okay. I think for me it's knowing what you know and learning what you don't, um, and being able to execute. Decisions or actions with high confidence, and then get a good result from it. Um, it's being able to understand how you're operating inside in, in normal situations, but also in a new, unexpected situation. To so say I've never seen this before, and then be able to uh, once a, once you realize that, be able to learn uh, that the new situation is integrated. Into the set of common experiences and common representations that you have. So, to me, it's about um, like an agent or perception system maintaining some kind of like a state of the environment, and also if the uncertainty in, in that state that it's currently at, and then and then somehow being able to use that uncertainty to maybe probe. Am I actually correct about this uncertainty or this state? And so I'm wonder, actually I'm wondering um, if there's if anybody has thought about like, it's so it's kind of it's easier to be able to say well this current most likely estimate of my world I can compare that to a true like you know outline of the room or something like that. But has somebody thought about evaluating how good the uncertainty? Is? So evaluate the evaluation. 
Yeah, like, you know, you could say, you could say okay, with 90%, there's probably a wall here, but evaluating that I'm 90% certain. You know, does that make sense? Like, yes, it does. It, 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 has anybody thought about that? Because I'm not even sure that makes sense. <laughs> no, it makes complete sense. Okay. I mean, that's the whole point of it, right? If you make an uncertainty estimate, you need to know how reliable is that uncertainty. Right. Otherwise, it doesn't make any sense, right? If you say 90% and it's actually much less than that, why would you then use that? That's exactly the point. I think that's that's very important. You need to calibrate that somehow. You need to know how, how, how good is the uncertainty estimate. And yeah, and then. Yeah, I think oh, there, is, there is also some, quite some work. Uh, depends on how you formulate it, because there is work on uncertainty and uncertainty. And, but I think normally how it is dealt with is that you have different types of uncertainty, and that you have different algorithms to deal with different types of uncertainty. So uh, there is some notion of understanding the type of uncertainty. So, and, and what that you get different kinds of uncertainty? Now you have possibility theory and probability theory oh. and you have them shaver and you have lots of different and types of distributions of uncertainty or understanding uncertainty mm -hmm. and also uh, uh, covariance matrices and covariance not covariance. Right. So you have all kind of different techniques which can deal with different types of uncertainties, which you need of course to understand what type of uncertainty you need. Okay. Um, yeah. So yeah. Okay. So um, in the beginning, I, I thought about that a lot, and I got myself into a bit of a muddle <laughs> because I thought about what, like when I cross the road, I don't really look down the road and I go mm, seven out of ten times. I would say that is a car, right? It doesn't really work like that. And so this this question, uh, there, there, there are two different aspects to this. One is sort of calibrating, for lack of a better word, calibrating uncertainty to a point where you have some more consistent measure where you know in, in a relative ranking of uncertainty mm -hmm. something that is less certain is you know less certain, so there's more certain actually right. less certain. Um, that's one thing and then there's the question of what those what do those numbers actually mean right mm -hmm. um, and I found that actually the meaning of them is, is really only so I, I don't know the meaning of them for me only really came to play when I wanted to attribute meaning to the threshold so if I set a threshold and I say, actually, seven out of 10 times, this needs to be correct. But then seven out of 10 times <coughs> would mean that three out of, you know, three out of 10 times, I'm okay getting run over, which also isn't quite right, right? So, so I, I, really, I really struggled with this, but I, for me, I kind of split that into those two different things. One is grounding the meaning, and the other one is coming up with a consistent fit, which is why ultimately, if you look at sort of the error profile of some of the classifiers that we looked at, uh, the entropy of those was more important than where the errors were actually made. You know what I mean? So the fact that it was sort of kind of delta peaky somewhere was more important as to where it, compared to where that peak was. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, maybe, maybe in addition to that, there, there, in my opinion, there's a difference between what to do to reason on uncertainty, so how to use information and process that, and how you deal with the uncertainty in different methods. And the effect uncertainty has on certain decision making, sort of goal oriented behavior. Um, so that actually that's related to the, in the question about the introspective method, because I think it has three components in introspection. What, so the one is what I call self assessment. So you have some kind of understanding, indeed, what you know. Or how well you know it, uh, what you don't know. So that's part of the self-assessment, and that's a good understanding on that. The part in self-management is understanding how you could improve that. So you have an understanding of your own working, internal working of your system, and understand what type of internal actions you could take to improve your understanding, whether it's reduction of uncertainty or knowing things you don't know, or try to understand how to deal with new information or new situations. And the third part, and I think that is a very important part, which is not, it's the most difficult part to do, is to relate that actions, relate your action, internal action space to actually 
what the goal of your system is. So how do you know what to do, what, how uh, uncertain or certain I have to be to reach my goals? I find my system first. And that is, it seems quite trivial, but it's absolutely not trivial. <laughs> One of the most difficult uh, things, in my opinion, is uh, how to do that in, in, in the most For me, I just want to comment on this. Uh, so I admit uncertainties, so I can uh, combine decisions from different uh, uh, system, subsystems on my, on my, on my robot. So um, here the numbers need to make sense. Uh, if you, want, you need to combine, combine them with, I don't know, obstacle uh, avoidance from laser and a classifier telling you there's a person. So that's what do you think about this one. Yeah, exactly. That, that's the most typical part because what we see in very complex systems that you need to optimize many different sub-functions in that system which can uh, interact with each other, mutual dependencies, all those kind of things. And then still you try to solve that, how to optimize all those different internal uh, actions towards your, towards your system goal. That's one of the most but finally, yeah, somehow, it is quite, we, <laughs> that's, yeah, finally, that's what we're after. I mean, it's, it's difficult, and we have to make all kind of uh, uh, simplifications on that, because we cannot solve that problem uh, fully. But finally, it's quite, it's obvious that you would like to make your system work in such a way that it can meet, with the resources it has, its goals and objectives. That's what's actually what I'm saying. So you don't. So you, what, the only thing what's important how to reach your total system goal in the best possible way, and whether that is reducing uncertainty of something in, in, in the classification algorithm or using your energy in the best possible way. So it can be anything in your system which you can help you to reach your goal in the best possible way. And if your accuracy is good enough, in the world, and there's no no impact or better accuracy has no impact at all on reaching your goals in a better way, then it's not you found, so you don't take any action on that. So then I, I have like a, because we are still in this very fuzzy stage, I would say. Like, so there is a in parallel happening workshop, and this is kind of more question to the audience and a bit less to the panel. Like in parallel, there is running a workshop which is titled uh, uh, System Evaluation. Verification of Verific the new systems. Verification <laughs> of the system, yes. And here's the, the question, like how verification of the systems, of the system is different from introspection and, and actually why have you choose to come here instead of the, of the other workshop, of course, because we have better families and the topic is more interesting. <laughs> <laughs> but for some reason for you, uh, introspection was more appealing and more interesting than system verification. So where, where do you see the difference and why it's more interesting? And question to the panel then is like, is there a, even such thing as introspection or is it just a special case of system verification? I know it's kind of like a... I, so I have a thought on that one and that is, and again, again this is system verification, at least as I understand it, also being something that's fairly fuzzy. I mean, introspection to me is you know, looking into the system as it's built, as it's, as it's done. Uh, but, but having you know, system verification, make sure the system's doing the right thing, um, it's kind of broader than, than that, right? Um, and you know, it could encompass other things that can make the system go wrong. Um, more general anomaly detection, right? I mean, introspection, I would hazard a guess, doesn't account for, doesn't tend to account for hardware failure of the system that's actually doing the decision making, for instance. Um, you know, whether, I don't know if the other workshop would consider, um, you know, cybersecurity aspects being part of system verification that I. I mean, I'd argue that that certainly covers it, 
but it's clearly, again, not something that is explicitly introspection, at least as far as the autonomous agent is concerned. It might be introspection from the perspective of maybe some separate agent that is observing for anomalous behaviour and trying to do detection of, of, uh, of in, you know, trying to do intrusion detection. But, um, but I would say that, that whether that's what we are considering as introspection here, it's possibly not quite the case. I don't know. Would any of my panel have, I, 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 I sense a disagreement here. Well, no, I don't. <laughs> um, you know, if, if the Russians attacking is a... Yeah, well, I did talk uh, or, uh, last year in the verification foundation workshop, so uh, on the very same subject. So I think it's very much related. It's also in my talk. Um, it's not the same. I mean, it's, for me, this, this whole idea of self-awareness or whatever you call that is the same as uh, introspection. Uh, it naturally comes out also in a way in which you can do online uh, verification validation. And one of the biggest problems I saw in verification validation discussion is that most people working in verification validation still try to think in, in that in terms of a design time Problem. So you design a system and then you do verification validation. Well, if we realize that an optimal working of those systems, those systems start to realize themselves that they are in a specific situation and base and define themselves and behave according in that specific situation in the best possible way. That's part of this explosion of the state action space that you cannot verify, validate everything design time a priori for all possible situations that will happen. So the, again, the way out, in my opinion, also for verification validation is that you have this introspection mechanism, and also online verification validation mechanism, in which you can even run time, see the performance of the system, and where that is based upon, and why it performs the way it performs. And so that very much boils down again to sort of the, the um, data betting sort of there's no there's no uh, verification method that I know of that can verify that a classifier or a detector you know does what it's supposed to do everywhere always. But this question of certifying that a system is able to work in a particular data regime is certainly out there. And so that's that's I think where we are there. And there's another problem and that is related to and I think again that's the most difficult step we have to make is that now the verification validation is also based, like system design, on local performance measures. So you, you reason about what kind of tracking algorithm, classification method I should use, and what's the performance of that in my system. And then we have some kind of a performance measure in terms of track accuracy or whatever, um, or what sensor to take. But it's a design time reasoning. And if we understand again that it should be optimal in every specific situation and that it should reach its goals and, and how well it is able to reach its goals is finally your performance measure, then then you, you also have a problem that you have not you do not know design time what the best quality measures is to uh, verify your system. Because it's only finally how well a system is able to reach its goals. And that you can only I think it's uh, high, oh, higher abstraction, it's connected to semantics, it's connected to reasoning, and it's connected to confidence. But I think it feedbacks to a lower level or a verification level. So for me, in a manipulation task, if I have an unmodeled behavior to disturb my system, a low level controller may not be able to reject that disturbance, and so it ultimately would lead to failure. For example, the, the accidental collision of a human onto a robot arm in the middle of a manipulation task. But if I can be able to understand what that means, then I can reason about it and find my way out of it with enough confidence to solve any problem. It's unique that though. You need to understand what it means, or you just need to know that something will go wrong. So, I think the more information that you have, you might be able to have better solutions for a problem. Undoubtedly, but you know, uh, yes. But I think in the first instance, for me, this idea is mainly about figuring out that something's actually gone wrong. And then you can, you can take whatever legal task you are able to do. Uh, but the key for me is knowing that something's gone wrong. Right. I think there's many layers to it. 
Yeah. Yeah. So to benefit from as much information as we can. Okay. Thanks. One more picture. But of course, you need to understand that something went wrong. Um, it's part of the self awareness. Yes. Uh, but then, of course, you should also understand, in my opinion, what you can best then do in that particular situation, given the fact that something like this time has gone wrong, because you also would like to reason what impact it has right. on reaching your goals again. So you have to reason then, okay, what in this particular situation, better understanding of knowing what went wrong and how that impacts your performance. Then you can start reasoning how to deal with that in the best possible ways, such that you can still be able to reach your goals in the best possible way. And I think it's interesting from a mature human example that once you experience an anomaly or, or some kind of failure, you are able to quickly learn from that one example and avoid repeating that mistake. And maybe it takes two or three times where you very quickly avoid repeating that mistake. So I think that's a very interesting part of being able to learn and absorb what happened to you, reason about it, come up with a solution, and then never repeat it again. And what humans do very well is that once they, the mature adult, once they make a decision, that they're normally very confident about it. Like, I can grab this uh, glass, and almost always they're gonna be able to grab it. So their confidence is also correlated to their success. Um, and I think that's a very interesting connection of, of decision making. So for this, I, I would like to ask um, that Raymond pointed out that um, hardware failures or maybe a, a, a software module that is crashing does not um, belong to introspection, rather to... Well, I don't know it doesn't. I mean... You, you say it doesn't, but I would say, I mean, if a wheel falls off of my vehicle, right, that affects my, my, my performance, mm -hmm. and even though it's, it's nothing to do with, with well, the, AI... The but fact that the wheel falls off is... Why the wheel fell off, though, probably isn't. Yeah, but still, we, I, I, I think those watchdogs that, for example, check whether all software modules are running that are supposed right. to run should be part of introspection. We should not exclude this. Right, but I, I, I guess it's, it's, it's more you know, being able to deal with it like dealing with a perturbation of anything else. Um, I don't know that actually troubleshooting why a particular module keeps crashing or why the wheel falls off. But I mean, I don't, I don't know. I mean, does it? Is but it? you need to be aware. Yeah, you so, need to be aware. Uh, so that, that in, in the system models I use, we use, we make a distinction between mind, body, and brain in, in awareness. So because you can think about self awareness, what's the, what does the self refer to? I haven't discussed it at all. But we talk, everybody talks about self optimization, self awareness. But not many people talk about where the self refers to. And that indeed, I think, all it, so. In my talk, I said we have to be, you have to, be you have to reason about what you may, where you are aware of, and this is part of the type of reasoning. Are you aware of the working of your own cognitive functions, or should you be aware of uh, how your communication and computation system work, or should you be aware of your sensor, how your sensors work, or should you be aware of how your body or your wheels or whatever how they work? So that depends on how much gain you could make in being aware of that. So I, I completely agree. I think it should absolutely be part of it, depending on whether it's important to you. But I would be, we talk so much about, you know, we started out with Oli this morning talking about philosophy, and then we could you know, go into psychology and all sorts of stuff. To me, certainly, uh, introspection isn't that much of a fluffy thing. And that might be because I have a very limited view of it. Okay? Um, so I try to get robots to do a thing, a real thing in the real world. Um, and ultimately, I, in whatever subpart or the whole, I just want to get to a place where the machine knows that something is not as it should be. And I don't, I, I, you know, how that happens, I almost care about as a secondary sort of level, right? So whether we do that within the sort of classification framework or whether that's an external system and whether that external system just looks at the perception system or whether it looks just at the navigation system or whether it looks at the whole system or whether it looks at the hard, whether it's a software watchdog. I don't really, you know, I'm not particularly fussy about what I, you know, where I draw the line, as long as we know that something has actually gone wrong. Uh, if, if in me, uh, introspective means that, uh, because intro is already in the word, but it's about what is 
system can know about itself mm -hmm. and be looking at whatever it is itself. So that would, to me, would exclude something like ground truth information. Yeah. And that's where I would see the line for the, the overall verification that the system actually runs properly is whatever the system is able to know by itself. And that's also why I thought this was more interesting that than the, the verification problem because that's usually how robots work. They don't know the ground truth. And so that, to me, it's interesting also, uh, you know, on information theory, like almost level where what can a system you know, like where is the limit of what it can do right? about its own operation? Yeah, so it seems like we spent a fair amount of time between these one question and two sections. So having a little bit of a disagreement with that exactly. I was going to say stab is sort of operation. <laughs> I think I come kind of from a, a background to think about it. Like, you know, I'd like this view on this because it's, it's operational ground. Like, mm -hmm. Kind of the, the utility of this is like, what we care about is roboticists is like, I don't want my car to run over people. Right? That's actually sort of like what matters, operation. And so, you know, there's this question about design time verification and so on. If I could write down the correct model at design time, look at that as well. The problem is that we can't because we don't have the voice of knowledge. So I think every instance point intersection comes up in application. The real question is like, how can you evaluate the extent to which the model that you are currently operating under matches external reality? And what I kind of like about that is that's actually a statistical question, right? I mean, like, and there are very explicit ways of actually quantifying that can be done online at runtime. Right? So would we would we collectively be satisfied with accepting that as like the robotics definition of yeah. introspection you want to develop? Which part of it? Uh, yeah. The, the introspection is really about measuring the consonance of a particular model with external reality. That's, that's a good question, I would say. Uh, no, I wouldn't agree on that. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, th I think my, my definition, I mean, the very operational point of view is trying to, I think it's, that's all our operational research is about. It's trying to reach your mission goals. I mean, we use in, in the systems we develop, we talk about mission goals. So it's, it's also there in a the new situation. We're not talking about measures of effectiveness anymore or measures of performance anymore because measures of effectiveness, which is also very operational, is insufficient to make a, a runtime adaptive system work in the best possible way. We have to define these things in terms of also mission goals. In terms of and utility, actually. So uh, this is all about utility maximization and, and formulating the goals in terms of mission goals. Um, and what you need for that is a system which is understands itself, understands the mission goal, and understands how it has to change itself given a particular situation and the mission goal, and understanding of its own working. What, how it could organize itself in the best possible way to reach that mission. So there are many steps at one time <laughs> you need to take to come up with also how you could see that in terms of an operation. I, I don't agree. I think that yeah. uh, a system that doesn't act at all can still be introspective about itself. Yes, I don't think I think. Oh, that's, but I'm not, I'm not saying that that is not, uh, I'm not, I'm not saying that that's not, I'm only saying that. I'm, I'm talking about <clears throat> why we need introspection. So I think. Okay, but he wasn't talking. He was trying to give a uh, definition for what introspection is and not why. Yeah. Well. Okay. Okay. You, you, in a very small sense, you could say, if I only understand or have, an, uh, have a look at myself or the quality, uh, but I, I see introspection also as understanding how I can change myself. Mm. And I think that's, 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 that's a noble that's goal, different. right? That's a noble goal, but it's a very it's a very complex beast. And I think sure. we can probably make a lot of progress by sure. starting very, very simply. Uh, and almost, David, you almost had me there with that definition. I think it's, it's I think it's I think it's almost right. I, I would I would add one thing, and that is um, to also be able to look at the, the sort of um, provenance of the data that you have to deal with and whether you whether you know you have some form of idea of whether your system is, you know, is in a place to deal with it, to make useful uh, decisions based on that. That is, that is so that, that's almost, that's, I make that distinction because it's, it comes before having made the decision and going, ooh, 
I want it, right? Um, this is saying, actually, my training data has never had a black image in it. This looks a bit weird. Right? I, I doubt, you know, be, be careful. Okay. Yeah. So, I, so I, the definition that, that you pose, I'm, one thing that troubles me a little bit is, um, what about a system that is inter that has a human that's collaborating or interacting with it? Would you consider that the agent, you know, has to introspect, form, form some kind of introspection to provide the human with information as well? And how would that work with your definition? Yeah, so I, I guess you know, the thing is that this uh, sort of motivation for what I was looking at all this land and get all Right. Cool. Right. And I guess the, I think the event, the sort of the motivation behind my thinking of it this way is that essentially the output would be something like, I'm not sure what's going on because I'm all this Right. I tell you that something's definitely not right. Right. I mean, it, the, what your definition you give, I think, is very useful for introspection, for improving the system's own performance, or at least figuring out when the system itself is having issues. But I think it, I think we need more than that if we're going to have the agent collaborate with a human to achieve overall better performance more you generally. Like, like, you know, well, to, for instance, the simple fact, the simple example I gave is, is that you might accept slightly better predictive accuracy from a system that is able to convince a user one way or the other about who's correct. If your performance metric was can the user, can the human and the agent together get better performance, right? As opposed to a system that has somewhat high predictive accuracy, but wherever the user and the agent disagreed, the user had no idea who was actually correct. Um, you know that, I'm, and I'm, that's what I'm, I'm trying to figure out: a, does that is that is the is the generation of the is the agent's generation of that information to give to the user considered introspection, and if so, how does that fit in with the with the definition that you pose? Yeah, the, the use case with my interpretation of it was that was a little more about explainability of the model as opposed to whether or not the model itself is, is accurate. Um, right, but is that still considered introspection? When we talk about how we define introspection, I'm saying that is, if the agent needs to go into its models to generate that explanation, is that act of going into its model to do that considered introspection? So. Right, but is the... Translating into human... The, the, front, the, 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 the user-facing side that I agree, I'm talking about the side of it that, that's actually trying to dig the data out of its own models. Yeah, I guess there's maybe an unfortunate semantic position there. I guess. Right. I, mean, I, I, can, I can certainly see the I can certainly see the, the, the utility of having a, a, a requirement a desiring system to take something like that. I, I, I'm not even talking about the utility, but I'm trying to figure out the definitions at this point. Well, I, just <laughs> it's not, I, I guess I was trying to go for the broadest possible coverage. Mm. You know, that, right. I feel like this might be a scenario that would be most applicable. Well, I, 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 right. I'm, I'm not saying suggesting this. I'm just saying that if, if you're going for this sort of broader definition, how would that cover what I'm, the example I'm talking about? If, or, or would it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think mine might not have to say that. Which? I mean, yeah. I, mean, I guess my, my viewpoint is really coming from operation. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And yeah, from that point of view, we spend a lot of time. You know, thinking about this, and it's honestly the best I could come up with after about six years is knowing when, not what, but knowing when you don't know. Yeah, <laughs> as good as it's gone. But to me, at least, that, that to me at least, that encompasses most instances where I go, oh yeah, that's kind of I can see how that sort of. Yeah. But I'm a little confused here because understanding that, I mean, you should have an understanding what the impact of of, of your performance is then, at least, otherwise. It's useless to understand that you don't know certain things. I might push back on that a little bit, actually. Because I, I think about how, how would an expert, you know, even with, with expert human uh, operators in certain tasks, right? Like, let's say that you're in open parts or something, right? I mean, if you cut something wrong, right? Like, it's very useful to know that you've made a mistake, right? And you might be a trainee, and so you might not know what to do. But, you know, in that situation where people, even what experts are and say, okay, something here is not right. I'm like super confused by this. Mm. Can somebody please help me figure this out? Right? I mean, and, that, and we, we consider that to be completely acceptable behavior uh, for interpersonal interaction as well. So I think that even, I would settle for detection. Let me put it that way. I, certainly, adaptation is great. I would say that, like, I would, but I would settle for detection just in terms yeah. of like, usability and safety. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But the example you mean, you, the example you give is detection of final failure of the mission goal. Yeah. So, 
There's no, 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 no. That's not the example he gave. He gave the example of knowing that I've just done something wrong yes. and asking for help. That's how, how do you know you did something wrong? And what well, exactly. was it wrong? What was it? What? How do you know? So that's the point. That's the point. Because the internal model internet. Internet. Okay. should have happened. Yeah. It's no longer consistent with what is happening. Right? I think what? that's a difference between you saying or, understanding. Okay. Or, or it might it might still be consistent with it, but you can see that it's going to get you to a place where you're in trouble. Potentially, yeah. Right? But that, that's the same. Yeah. Right, exactly. So, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but this is not about mission failure. This is very much then about saying, actually, we might need some other input, some yeah. supervisor, somebody like in the active yeah. learning context, yeah. some oracle that says, actually, this is the label, whatever, right? Yeah. And I, I think this is, we're not going to come to the next, because I think it's an appropriate one, right? We're saying, like, you know, just because this example was so different from what I've seen in the past, you know, I, I just might not know what to do with it, right? Hmm. Yes. Okay. Uh, so, the question in the back? I was just thinking about the difference between the context of the Bible and what's the reason for the Bible, and that book when I think it's so part of the same. Uh, I, th I think there's still, in my opinion, a confusion here going on. And I tried to explain it. Okay, I tried to explain it one more time. So we, have, we had some uh, talks here about uh, vision and, and under what circumstances uh, that was a good, good output of uh, vision and sometimes not. Or uh, sometimes. Form of, of path plan. So finally, you could see the mission goals as the path plan. If you know that your vision, vision system is insufficient, for example, it's in, inaccurate in some kind of object, you still do not have a translation to what actually you, you want to do with the information. So it's only this is only true if you have immediate mapping of what you finally want your system to do. If for example, you send something and you have an uncertainty, but you have no clue how that uncertainty impacts finally what you want to do. You still have a problem. So you need to know more than that. You need to know how that uncertainty impacts actually on your final goal. And so in a complex system, most, most output of most functionality, it's not clear at all how that quality of that output actually Influences your performance. Yes, I think it all boils down to understanding what is utile. So you say, okay, what is useful? But so a system needs to understand, in my opinion, utile of everything it has, or whether it's data or uncertainty, whatever. But what is utile or what is reliable or whatever can, in my opinion, only be defined in terms of whether it's able to reach its goals in the best possible way. Otherwise, it's it's 
the sun system for in the surgery, uh, the only acceptable outcome is to avoid the Yeah. Uh, certainly, like, for example, the robots that I work with are low speed, so almost always the safe thing to do is things get crazy with the sun. But if you're doing a self driving car, Oh, yeah, I mean, sure. Um, from again, from a system perspective, you you could, you could make everything adaptive and reason about its utility, but it's way way too too much. So what you do actually is only for those uh, quantities which are really critical. There, it's worthwhile to reason about what an impact actually of a certain quality of information or whatever is on the on the mission goal. For a lot of things, you could deal with indeed with rules, okay, this is good enough on a much lower level. So again, that is also, in my opinion, a cost-effectiveness balance. How much effort you put in making it really reason about its own utility. That's only useful for probably a limited set of, uh, of parameters in your system, and for the rest you could use these type of rules which you mentioned. So practically, yes, how would you do that? From a system engineering's perspective, you, tr you try to reason, and, and uh, we've done that right. for, for, for what you actually. So, an example, but it's simply uh, as an example, we uh, did uh, distributed uh, uh, situation assessment capability for a task group of frigates. And there, there was a really constraint in communication because it's very expensive to have a broadband communication system between frigates on, on, on the sea. So we, from a system engineering's perspective, we saw, well, there's a, there's a big bottleneck there, mm -hmm. in, and so it's very important to really reason about the utility of information, because it, <laughs> it's so expensive to exchange this information, so there's a, we, we made something mm -hmm. like explicit reasoning about how utile mm -hmm. particular information was, for actually the, the, the operational picture. Okay. So, so that was uh, an example in which it's really worthwhile to look at how important this information is for the mission goal you would, you would want to reach. But I, so I, not for I, a, I recognize a that example, but I struggle I struggle to translate that into into my world. So could you map from that to something that for example, you know, a detector running on some robot in the real world? Uh, well, I think there was an example of a dynamic threshold, which is also another example of that you can reason how utile it is where to put your threshold in, for example, a detection algorithm. Okay, but um, why why wouldn't the output of that just be, yes, I can work with this, and no, I can't work with this. Yes, useful information, no, not useful information. Yeah, but how do you know what is useful? That is the point. Well, not really, because ultimately this is what we're talking about, right? Yes, <laughs> but that's where I'm talking about no, too. But, but this is, but this is, no, but so, 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 in terms of what is useful information, there, there are a couple of couple of ways of figuring this out. I mean, we can go full out information theory if you like. We don't have to, right? Um, there is a way of saying actually within my classification detection system, whatever, if there is some indication that the data that I'm getting in right now, the current test data, is so far removed from what I know how to deal with. That is not useful in terms of data for my decision making right now because I don't trust myself to do anything useful with it. Okay, that's one mechanism. And the other mechanism is to say, well, actually, there's a third-party system that just looks at the data that comes in and goes <coughs> either statistically, which is a really good point. I mean, you know, there, there are lots of you know, massive overlap. Either statistically, this thing is an outlier compared to what I know, or that says actually, I can map directly from this to a performance estimate, and your performance is not going to be good enough to do what it is we usually like to do. So for me, that is a really useful place to start, because right sure. now I got nothing. But we completely agree. Excellent. Good. Only what I'm saying that it's all <laughs> part of some mechanism in which you're able to reason about how utile something is to do. Yes. So, and then finally, utile is perform is defined in how well you're able to reach the goals you have with your system. Because that is finally how utility, that is your goal. So <laughs> you, that's finally where you have to relate 
what is good or bad or utile. Yeah, that's the only thing. Saying. And that is more difficult, as from my experience, than I thought that would be. So people say, okay, we, we come up with, with rules, but finally to map it completely to uh, dynamically to your mission goal, that's very more complicated. Yeah, I don't think you have to go to the entire mission goal part. I think that would be a nice thing, but you don't have to do that. I think no, no you only have to do it in, indeed if it's very critical, and, and yeah, that depends well, how also, far you have to go. But even if it's very critical, knowing that a particular subcomponent can't do it, 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 there is a danger that the particular subcomponent can't do its job properly is useful knowledge, right? Particularly when it's critical. Sure, sure. Yes, please. Well, that's why it's so difficult, because finally it's only one goal, a mission goal. But what we do now is we have for every function we have these kind of quality measures, and each then each you can see there is a multi-agent system then in which each function tries to uh, reach its local uh, goal. But so th this is the, the biggest and, and hardest part. So and there, there is no one goal. That's, that's another way of saying it. That's what how we do it now. And that's finally, why should a vision system have its own goal? I mean, there's only a mission goal. So the, 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 the vision system should be also work in towards that mission goal. And that is the biggest uh, problem. So let's try to figure out, because there's mutual dependencies and all these different sub-functions use different res the same resources. So there are Neutral dependencies in trying to come up how these different entities all together maximize the mission goal. It's it, it's quite difficult for most people to to. <laughs> How do you optimize them? But if you have different goals, but what's yeah, your? But you think then that you think then that a goal. Yeah, yeah, I understand. But you think then that a goal of a observation system is equally important than a goal of uh, trying to uh, drive safely. There's an hierarchy in the goals, and and one is. The, the vision system only works finally because it wants to, uh, to drive safely and, and, and comfortably, and so on. that's your main goal. And and the, and the observation system, could, you could that's the way it's done now. Mm -hmm. So we have these these, these sub goals on on the vision and sub goal on tracking and sub goal on classification, but that's suboptimal. Does anybody here, out of interest, sorry, am I allowed to ask? Does anybody here feel like, you know, when you come home to your own robots and you build your own systems, you're going to do anything different after today? 
do you think do you think hey I'm gonna I'm gonna try and do a thing but yeah go on. Oh, yeah. yeah I think I will um, it's about the, the final goal of the system so the subcomponent need to know about the, the, the overall or the ultimate goal of the system and that need to be included in the optimization of, of the exactly. subsystem. Uh, I like the example with the back planning and uh, the mm -hmm. detection. This is a, a nice example because usually when you tell the detector uh, the obstacles, you get it either off the shelf or somebody else develop it for you. But in that scenario, we have it. We have the, the feedback, the end goal, mm -hmm. from back to the to the to the subcomponent. And this is a new thing. I think. I, I, and finally, you could even change that. You could optimize on that if you understand that. You could. <laughs> so, I'm a pretty simple character, right? And there is, like, but my view of the world, I wonder sometimes whether everything in the world is really sort of nearest neighbor, okay? So, um, <laughs> I, I do wonder whether I actually go through life having experienced some stuff when I was a kid, and I go, well, you know, internally, this is so much like this other thing, it's fine. I can just deal with it, okay? Um, and I don't have, have, has anybody here kind of read Daniel Kahneman's work? Thinking yes. fast and slow. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So people, if you haven't read it, please kind of acquaint yourselves with it because it's awesome. Um, right. But in this massive oversimplification, right? He's got this. He's sort of two systems. System one, which is basically this nearest neighbor idea, right? You go, okay, well, I've dealt with this in the past. Uh, in, with this in the past, I kind of recognize it's a similar sort of situation, and I will just do this, and it's almost free in terms of the resource, your brain, kind of resource that you spend. Okay. And then there's system two. And system two is the one that kind of kicks in when you see or when you somehow encounter something that is totally different, right? And one of the one of the examples that um, Kahneman gives in his book is uh, this, where you know, imagine you walk along with a friend, and there's lots of stuff you can do while walking. You can talk, and you can observe, and you can describe, etc. But now imagine that your friend asks you this really fiendishly difficult math question. Okay, this really really hard question. And you'll probably find, and you probably have experienced this at some point, I suspect, that you start to walk ever so slightly more slowly, right? Until you get to the point where you actually have to stop because you're concentrating so hard on this one problem that all your other resources are taken up with just thinking about this problem, right? And so I really like that view of the world, even though it's massively oversimplified and I'm barely qualified to talk about it. But I like this this sort of this sort of idea that there is the yeah, I can do this because I recognize it, and Actually, there's something here that I really need to think about for a bit. Now, one thing that I totally don't know, and please enlighten me right, if, if anybody knows this, but one thing that I really don't know is who decides whether something just gets dealt with by system one or whether something actually requires your full sort of brain apparatus to think about this. Because to me, that also kind of goes back to this whole question. It's kind of inspired many of the things that I thought about, sort of my understanding of, of, uh, of you know, machine introspection as such. Something that goes, and, and a lot of the kind of performance prediction work that we did is also inspired by that, right? Where we say there's a whole bunch of times when actually I've dealt with something like this, and this sort of strategy is likely to work here. So the path planning one is, is a very typical example of, of that, where you go, actually, 
based on this scene, I can directly map from a scene to a, to a trajectory that I might rank high up so I can evaluate it first because if that's the one that's likely to work, this is fast, right? Um, or to say, well, actually, um, based on this particular scene, I couldn't really go five meters to the left because I would never find my way back. It's sort of stuff like that. Um, so I feel I feel a lot of sort of comfort in, in, in the, the synergy between those two views. I have no idea how you switch between one and two. Actually, I think Daniel Kahneman says they run at the same time and there's some sort of weird thing going on. I, I don't know how you switch between. It's amazing. It's great that you mentioned it because I just finished Kahneman. And I think, I think it can be built in system one and system two. And it's quite, in my opinion, quite obvious how that fits into introspection and self-awareness. Totally. Though for me, the, the key to introspection for me there is, is this, this switching. This, yes. this how do I know yeah. that I need more resource or yeah. something? Exactly. And that goes yeah. back to what we discussed yeah. earlier about actually yeah. knowing that something's wrong is really valuable because I can do a thing with it. Right. So, it's, yeah. so yeah. My, my understanding, at first I like the analogy. Uh, my understanding is slightly different because I don't think it's a, a sweet switching. I don't, need, I don't think it's a tweet. I don't think it's even binary. Yeah. Something that continues because our whole world continues. And allocation of resources also continues process. Yeah. Um, and from that perspective, I also think just checking that something is wrong or something is not wrong, binary decision is probably not sufficient. It's probably a first step. Let's say that the simplest problem that you can formulate and that you somehow have a chance to solve. For me, the main question is, and I'm also the optimist driving the main, um, and their safety is a very important topic, right? The, the question is, what will be the next step to get in that direction? We all know that the eventual goal of maximizing that utility is basically the formulation of the end chance problem. You get some sensor data, you take an action, right? And this would be amazing for, I, to ultimately solve that problem, always in a, in a safe way that is verifiable and validated, uh, and validated right? It would be amazing. I think that's not a one step thing to get there. And so my question would be, what is the next step in that direction? To, to have not a discrete decision, to, to close that loop or that chain between the estimation and decision making. And I mean, there might be some interface between those two. Um, how does such an interface look like? I think Ruby gave an impression on that. We talked about that also in similar detail. And how do we do the next step in, in those things? Because I think that decomposition will be there. But um, how can we take the next step and get away from the speed of binary and get it to something that we see a chance to going towards a new system that always performs and is always safe? Okay. I thought you thought. Yes, I have many thoughts. No, I was actually pointing at Rudy. <laughs> <laughs> so, saying, taking the next step, saying once you have this introspective system, how, what do you do with it? Is that the question? Or? Well, for this. The, the introspection, I mean, you were talking about when to ask for help. Yeah. Ingmar said, when do you take that you can't do anything and you better shut down or switch, or switch to a fallback system mm -hmm. or whatever, mm -hmm. right? Or, and hand over to the safety driver. And eventually you want to have a system that doesn't have a safety driver, doesn't need to ask for help. Right? That's just an intermediate step for us. Mm -hmm. So um, how can we take the next step in that direction? How can you get rid of the safety driver? Is, it, is that basically what you want to say? How can we get in the direction that we don't need to ask for help? That instead of asking for help, we take a careful action and maybe doing some kind of active perception or doing something <coughs> else that might help us to figure out what to do. Okay, but that's more than inspection, right? And the inspection is, is the first step for, to, for the necessary for the step for that? Um, yeah, of course, eventually that's much more than introspection. But introspection, what we have discussed so far, is not sufficient. I, I think we need to walk along that introspection right, path, right. path much we need further that, until yeah. we can make the final step and remove all that. Right? But so what is the next step? For, for you present, but I think if for your case, I think uh, there's a special way of doing it, and it should be also otherwise. So if, if it's a safety critical situation as you have it, then there's a special way of uh, answering that. But I, I don't think there's a possible answer that holds for general cases, right? You cannot say in general the next step is that, right? So I think you, for robotics in general, you need inspector systems. But then, whether it's at, at the learning, for example, you take different next steps than in, in the case of, of, of autonomous driving. 
I think the process is running in parallel, so it's not a yes or no one system or the other. It's that related to the system only you use for this long story. But there, in my opinion, there are ideas of next steps, and but it's it's related to how process system one or system two work together. That, that there are different ways that can be done. So you could have a system one which actually understands what it, that it's failing and hands over to system two, or you could do the other way around. So, and how to implement it in system model is also something which uh, there are different models which do different ways of modeling this type of interaction between system one and system two. But, yeah, so it's not clear how that what what the best way of doing it. Uh, how to talk to my so I this one kind of, I haven't read the um, the text you're referring okay. to, so please but correct me if I'm if, if I get this wrong. But the, so you're saying system the system one two it sounds an awful lot like you know, subconscious skill versus conscious thought, right? That, is that the separation that they're that they're um, going for? Because maybe, because but it's, it's certainly something that you do subconsciously. Because the I mean the danger, and this is this is also the same danger that that I guess um, that the, I see from you know, so the more um, the more uh, opaque you know models doing things, and that is is that if you're I mean, this is why human drivers have accidents. One of the reasons is because the, the skill of driving, when you learn to drive, it's very, very complicated. You've got to think, I've got to turn the wheel this much, I've got to do blah, blah, blah. And eventually, you, your conscious mind does it so often that it starts training the subconscious mind, and then eventually it's all hidden in the back of your head. Um, but at the same time, though, it, start, it starts distilling out what's important, what's significant, and all of a sudden you go around a road and you find a, a, a kangaroo in the middle of the road or a, you know, pick your favorite large animal, um, and all of a sudden, you don't have a. You, your conscious mind definitely has a model how to deal with this, but it's gotten so used to being disengaged from it because your subconscious mind is, is active, and that, you know, of course, you're, you you don't have time to do the handover before you um, before 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 you end up hitting the hitting the animal. Yeah, that's um, not what happens. That's, right? that's not what happens in practice. So what does happen in practice? So in practice, typically, even mm. when you're so totally daydreaming because mm. you've been driving along, mm. because, you know. Ever, mm. you still notice when something extraordinary happens. Right, but the thing is that that but the point is is that your subconscious doesn't know how to deal with it. it has to hand over quickly to your conscious to deal to do something about it. Okay, that's why that's why you can't steer around uh, steer around it or do something without it without being startled. Right. You can say yeah. uh, slamming on the brakes. Yeah. Uh, an action taken by the subconscious. It's a reaction. Yeah. No, but the, 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 the point being is, is that slamming on the brakes is not necessarily the right action at that point. Yeah, it's, it's, it's an action yeah. taken by that system. Right. And um, the action is somehow triggered by the introspection mm, because the introspection mm, knows something's wrong yeah. exactly. and slams the brakes. That's what mm. I meant. My question really was, what is the next step to get mm. better than just slamming the brakes? Mm. Well, do you need a more detailed introspection than just seeing something's wrong? Mm. Do you need that? I mean, in that case, slamming the brake is maybe not the best thing. But it solves the situation, and ideally, you have a situation, uh, a system that, over time, sees the situation more often, and then, at some point, sees better or have, has better solutions to it. Mm. So, as long as it has this solution that solves the thing, with uh, whenever it's completely new, like if it knows something is completely new, it doesn't have any idea, but it says, okay, I don't know what to do, I knew it would say the thing. But then, if you have the same system. Learning over time, all right, and being more, let's say, aware of, of these kind of things. Um, next time it does the right thing, right? But it can only do that if it's in distraction. So, so that's I think that's the the thing. So you, you cannot, in the first time you have this, you cannot do the right, the first perfect thing. But at, at least you do something that isn't wrong, right? Hmm. Um, 
One thing you said was interesting, of course. Many things were interesting, of course. But one thing, one thing you said was <laughs> interesting. Least thing, yeah. At least one thing, and in the sense that you know, you, you sense it's not one or the other system, one or two that kind of run in parallel. I, I really want to embrace that view. I think that is probably right in some way. But of course, if one takes lots of resource and the other one really doesn't, they can't do everything in parallel, right? So I haven't quite figured that. My, my my hunch is like yours, but I haven't quite figured this out. In terms of what's what's next on the safety driver front. Um, uh, there's a long answer and a short answer. The short answer for that is um, resource. So uh, one way of seeing this is, and this is this is not a complete answer because ultimately, if you get complete situational awareness, then you wouldn't have this problem in the first place, right? Uh, but uh, imagine that you train an end-to-end -end system using a standard planner, right? So imagine you put a vehicle in, a, in an environment, uh, and very much like Marshall's uh, uh, drone work, you say, actually, I'm going to run my planner, I'm going to run everything else, I'm going to execute. Uh, you train the system like that. If you then say, okay, um, you execute your deep learner, your fixes to talk bit, right? You execute that, but in there is, so that's your system one, that just goes, ah, oh, this situation, this is the plan, this situation, this is the plan. Uh, once you then have a mechanism that says, actually, uh, I'm not entirely sure what the situation is and whether I can actually produce a useful plan for this, you then might choose to somehow switch to your system two, and that would be something much more elaborate where you go, actually, I might have to run the plan from scratch for this, right? So um, I think that's that's part of the answer. So I would like to ask you, in the end, one, one question, because you, you asked, like, what you would do differently, and I would like to each one of you to give one sentence take home message after this workshop. So what you would like to kind of tell to everybody, to, to the audience from from the talk, from the discussion, of the condensation of your insight and introspection. Okay. Yeah. Start. Okay. Um, so uh, I would say this has been great. Um, I would say don't get too hung up on the on the exactly what definition it is or what philosophical problem we're trying to solve here. Um, and on the fact that we use the term introspection, ultimately, it's you know for me it, it boils down to knowing when you don't know. So, you know, when you have your individual subsystems, when you have your overall system, when you have a goal, it's very much a systems thing, and you try to get a robot in the real world to do a thing. Um, see whether you can somehow have a mechanism of whatever ilk that tells you whether the data that comes in or the the, uh, the decisions or the output of the individual subsystem. Mm -hmm. Are in some in some way meaningful, and if you don't, if you can't find out whether they're meaningful, find out whether the data that came in 
actually lends itself to being analyzed properly in the regime that you're in. That's good. So that, that, very long sentence. Uh, excellent. Thank you. <laughs> That's it. Um, there were a lot of comments. I, I, I guess this. Uh, Possibly again, is you know, it's for a broader, a slight broader de definition of introspection. That is, um, you know, these are systems that you're developing that will be interacting with other systems and with other people in there. Um, so making sure that the introspection of the of the agent can also support whatever it needs to do to interact with other systems and other and other people, I think, is something that's is quite important. And having that baked in at the start uh, might require certain con certain considerations that that don't often get considered. Yeah, so my also my understanding before I came here about introspection is also very similar to what Ingmar said. So it's just about knowing uh, that something goes wrong. I think this still is the same understanding here. And I uh, also think that it's in agreement here in the audience that we, we think that this, this is at least the uh, uh, common denominator. Um, and I also think that it doesn't have to be more than that, right? So the uh, everything which comes on top of that and standing and everything which is on top of that is not necessarily part of the introspection thing, but it's it's it uses that. So it's it's like introspection is necessary for the other one, other one, but not not vice versa. And I think we have found an agreement on that, and that's also what makes me very happy. So thanks. <laughs> yeah, maybe it sometimes seems that we have not so much agreement, but I think we very much agree. And sometimes the discussions <laughs> is uh, semantics, like understanding what is wrong can be many, have many aspects and depending on how much aspects you put into it that it could be complete yeah so <laughs> but uh, so the, I think the discussions is more semantics uh, and finally I think we agree on a lot of things about how to, uh, how to go on and how to pursue so I would like to say thank you to Delvis to the panel to everybody who was involved in creating this workshop and uh, almost, it's almost time to have. <laughs> yeah, I think outside of the time schedule, it's fine, and it's almost time to have the go to reception party. So have a have a nice evening, and thank you very much. Thanks to you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.